Now, I'd like to begin the sermon this evening with you, a testimony that you have had. What has God recently done in your life? What is it, what is it that you can point to Jesus for and say, you know something? I may not have known he was with me at that moment, but look how it worked out. Look at how my kids are responding to this. Does anybody have a, a brief testimony, just a recent event in your life? No, I know you all have one. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. statement. I went from, oh, I'm not loud enough? Okay. I went from being in marketing with a radio station to having a horse rescue ministry where, and, uh, where we open up the doors of the horse rescue for senior citizens, uh, disabled children. And it's just, it's a true, the Lord said to me after these horses arrived, it's not about the horses. And I'm thinking, uh, 23 starving horses? It's got to be about the horses, right? No? Three times this happens, I'm kind of doing the Samuel thing. Is that you, God? But truly, um, my life has changed. I would never go back. Uh, and it's a blessing to the community. And we're able to uh, share the Lord with everybody who comes out to the ranch. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Because tonight, next week, and the week after, I want to talk about the anointing of God. Uh, this week could just be the anointing of God to fulfill the call of God on your life. Uh, next week, it'll be the anointing of God to heal. Um, I don't know if there's ever been a time where there's been more pain in people's lives than today. If you give people the opportunity to line up and pray that they be healed, most of the healings would not be physical. Most of the healings are the brokenness that goes inside, that, that fractured inner person, that mental and emotional breakdown that people are facing all the time. So week two, it's how the anointing will heal. Not just physically heal, but heal the things that really have wounded us. And then uh, the third week, it'll be the anointing, the spirit of fatherhood and sonship. How deep can a relationship go? Today I'd like to talk with you about the anointing. There's, um, there's a pastor... And he played hooky on Sunday morning. He went out golfing. Now, you know, we would permit that. Just we'd, we'd call it tee it up and we'd say, okay, go for it, pastor. But he called his assistant pastor and got some coverage. And he just kind of snuck out in the golf course. And he's on the first tee. It's a 420-yard par four. And he hits the ball, kind of typical for him. But God sends a wind. A trailing wind and it just takes the ball up in the air soars the ball right to the green the ball lands on the green and goes in the hole one of the angels turns to God and said what did you do that for he said well who's he gonna tell <laughs> we we live in a time we absolutely, positively have to have God's help. I don't mean just on a golf course. I mean every day of our life. We need him. Yes, we need him. Every hour we need him. And if there's anything that this world needs today, it's the anointing of God on the people of God who are called to fulfill the purposes of God. I have a question for you. At this time in your life, do you sense that God is calling you to do something important. How many people are saying right now, I know God is calling me to do something important. And you may be saying, I've done some good things in the past. I was privileged to be part of some important things. But now is a different day. God is either changing the chapter and introducing me to a new chapter in my life, or he's saying, I'm closing the book and I'm going to write another volume, and you're going to write it. There are people who are facing this pivotal time right now in their life. I would encourage everyone to know as much about the anointing of God and walk in the anointing of God 
as humanly possible. This is like a fourth quarter call. Now, a few of us are in the fourth quarter of life. Okay, just by virtue of our age, we're in the fourth quarter. But the fourth quarter is when you win. I mean, you know, that's the time to win. So this is going to be a ministry series for fighters. If you're a fighter, stay tuned, because the anointing will win it for you. The Apostle Paul says this, I've fought the good fight. That's a great statement. I have fought the good fight. I have stayed the course. I have run my way, my race, and I've won it. Now, for me, there's laid up a crown of righteousness. I would love that for every single person who buries the name of Jesus, that we could say we too have fought the good fight. You know, there was no quit in the Apostle Paul. And there's no quit in the people of God who live by the anointing of God. You just couldn't. It would be impossible to quit once you experience the good anointing of God. But in our land today, how many people know that we we're, we're have to face the giants in our land? Remember the movie Facing the Giants? Is this, this unpredictable, this little team from a little school having to face a huge team fully equipped who have won the state championship times before, years before. And the coach, I love this line, he says, who will fight the giants with me? Who will fight the giants with me? Kim, could I have a a glass of water? I believe if you listen, I believe if you listen to the quiet thunder of God, you will hear God asking that same question. Who will fight the giants with me? We have more giants in our land than we have ever had at any time that I can ever remember. How about schools without prayer? And, and a lost generation who've lost a moral compass with morality something that we have to fight for today. No Ten Commandments in our courthouse buildings. Would you say... Our government is more honest today. <laughs> Nobody's going to say that. We, we all have a sense that, say? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. We have giants in our land. Would you call 50 million, dollar, uh, 50 million abortions? A giant in the land? That's a giant in the land. Where godless godless evolution is taught, it's still a theory, but it's taught like it's a fact and published in books like it's a fact. We're facing giants of lies and deceit like we've never had to deal with. The evil leaders today, there are people who are leading who believe, truly believe that they're above the law and that you and I, we the people, have no voice and deserve no voice. Uh, You can almost hear the command. Sit down, shut up, and do what you're told. The Constitution and its freedoms in our country are more at risk than they've ever been. Health care. I can't believe what people in our government, the Harry Reeds, have said nobody over the age of 75 deserves health care. He's well over 75. Do you think he believes he deserves health care? And the legislation, the legislation, listen, If people will kill the innocent unborn, the next are our seniors. Those who are the most defenseless. I'm not so sure that we just don't have the the first steps to legislative genocide. That's evil in our day. The church is being persecuted around the world. And I wouldn't be surprised if in our generation we'll see we'll see more persecution than ever. 
I just came back from Israel and we went through a Holocaust museum. You know what the word on the street today is? The Jews just made up the Holocaust. That it's a perpetrated hoax. In fact, if you're a teacher in England and you teach that the Holocaust happened, you're out of a job. We're seeing systematically governments and societies and cultures being set up for the next Holocaust. Well, God has some news. I would like to share with you and use Moses as and the anointing as the answer to the call of God on our lives and on the church. That if there's going to be change, it's going to have to be by the power of God, the ability of God, the anointing of God to fulfill the call and destiny of God on each and every one of our lives. The anointing reflects God's nature. It's, it's how God does things. It's how he moves on the earth. Do you know, when God moves, he always moves by his anointing, and it's always good. It reflects his goodness. Remember Hebrews 10.38? It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But he did good. When a rich young ruler run, runs up to Jesus and throws himself at his feet, and he says, good master. He said, hold on just a minute there. Only God is good. Only God is good. When the anointing of God is available for you and me, it'll always produce the nature of God and it'll always come out to be God's goodness. God has a certain way of doing things and he will not compromise. The anointing means to accomplish the mission and call of God. So if you have your Bibles, let me ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 1. Let's start... Let's start by taking a look at the life of Moses and the times of Moses because we've got, some, we've got some lessons that God has for us today. In Exodus 1, verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. They waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. You get the picture? God says to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to increase you. And even though they find themselves slaves in another country, God says, I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to multiply you. And then it says, now, there arose in, in Egypt a king that didn't know Joseph. He made their lives bitter. In verse 11, he set taskmasters to afflict them in their burdens. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they, this grieved the Egyptians. The Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor and hardship. They made their lives bitter and hard with bondage. So Pharaoh said to the midwives, keep the women, keep the girls alive, and kill every male child. However, the midwives feared God and would save the lives of both the, the boys and the girls. Therefore, in verse 20, God dealt well with the midwives and, and the people multiplied. They became very mighty. Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born, cast him into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. In Exodus chapter 2, this is the notable story of Moses being born. Moses' parents look at him and they say, something is special about this child. There's something good. There's something godly about this child. For three months, they try to hide it. But they can't hide it anymore, so they put him in a basket, put him in the bulrush, and you know the story. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and brings him up as her own son. Now, I believe that Moses had a sense that there was a call of God on his life. I believe Moses, at some time in his life, his growing, up, his growing up years, that it came to pass that he discovered, in verse 2, he discovered that he was a Hebrew. One day, as he's visiting his Hebrew brothers, he sees an Egyptian oppressing one of the Hebrews. 
Have you ever had a defining moment where you just snapped? I call it the Popeye moment. You remember Popeye? Yeah, that, that great hero long ago, Popeye the sailor man. And Popeye had a dad who taught him some courage, and it was old Pap. Remember that? And then Popeye had the love of his life, olive oil. What a great name, olive oil. And she was a, boy, she was a, a head turner and a, a car stopper. And she would just cross the street, you know, and you just, it wasn't quite, and Popeye just loved olive oil. But it came to the point where the villain, Bluto, would harass and begin to oppress. And remember the famous words of Popeye? That's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. And so out comes the spinach. The arms, the arms are pretty ugly, but they're big and they're powerful. And Popeye just saves the day. He had this defining moment. He just sprung. And I'll tell you, then Bluto was history. I believe... I believe Moses had this same defining Popeye moment where he discovers he's a Jew. And this nation is enslaved. And he has a sense there's something about God's call on his life. He knows there's something wrong about this. And he knows he's called to do something about it. And he sees the oppression go on right in front of him. He has a Popeye moment. He snaps and he kills an Egyptian and buries him in the sand. There's only a little problem with that. The problem is that it's not good. If God's going to trust Moses with his anointing, it won't be so he could murder other people. It won't be so he could take the life. God is in the business of saving life through his anointing. So God's got to do something with this Moses guy. He, flo- he flees to the Midianite wilderness. And for 40 years, he works for his father-in-law, Jethro, and he becomes a shepherd. 40 years. You know, you've got to be pretty patient to have a call of God on your life and wait 40 years and just hang around being a shepherd. Like there was... Nothing else to do. However, the time comes where God is ready to make his move, and there's a period of time where Moses had a chance to reflect. Moses had a chance to make a decision. He's going to do it God's way. In Exodus, chapter 3, verses 4, and when the Lord, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside. Now here's the burning bush ex- experience. Moses is out there just tending his sheep. He's got his rod, his staff in his hand. He's out there tending sheep. And all of a sudden he sees this bush burning but not consumed. And you know the story. But I want to point one thing out to you here because it makes a difference with our calling and our anointing. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God then called out in the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. If you sense you're at a pivotal place in your life where God is calling you to do something, whether it's a new chapter or whether it's a new volume, when God leads you to a calling, he will never call your name, equip you, and empower you until you turn aside. Absolutely essential that Moses had to turn first and then God recognized him, called his name and said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. He gives him instructions and Moses, you know the story, Moses says, you know, I can't do this. This is too much. I stutter and God has a whole bunch of answers for his objections. But it comes down to this. In chapter four, Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not listen to me. They won't believe me. 
They won't hear a word I have to say. They'll say the Lord hasn't appeared to you. Listen, when you answer to turn the call, there will be opposition. It will not seem like everything is just going to go your way automatically all the time. God sends Moses to leadership school. And the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. So God says, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. The Lord said to Moses, now put forth your hand and take it up by the tail. He stretched forth his hand. He caught it. And it became a rod once again. <clears throat> that little... That little two or three verse in the Bible, it means just everything about whether or not God will trust you with his anointing, whether he will trust me. You know, when God says what's in your hand, it wasn't because he didn't know. It's because usually we don't know what's in our hand. We don't know what the potential is. But God says, I'm going to send you to some leadership training school, Moses. Now, take that rod and throw it down. And when he cast the rod down, it left his hands and became a serpent. And then he says, uh, now pick it up by the tail. How many know that you don't pick snakes up by the tail? I mean, it's just not good snake handling. But here's what God is asking Moses to do. A rod to a shepherd is extremely personable, pers personal and meaningful. Now a shepherd would would etch his name on the staff. He would date certain events. He would carve in the most, most meaningful experiences of his life. His entire life would be carved into that, that rod. Everything, everything that means something to a shepherd would somehow be recorded here. What God is asking Moses to do and what God is asking anyone who will answer the call and turn aside First of all, he says, Moses, I want your identity. God's not making this easy. Moses, cast the rod down. I want your entire identity. Number two, the shepherd's rod represented his provision. This is how he made his livelihood. This is how he lived. This is how he took care of his wife and his children. God is saying, I want you to not only give, give me your identity, I'm asking you to give me your livelihood. Everything that you trust in to take care of your wife and family, I'm asking you to give that to me. And the third thing this rod represents, it represents his future, his destiny, what he would become as a shepherd. I mean, do you kind of get a sense here? that if God is going to trust us with his anointing, he's going to ask us some pretty difficult things. Will you give your identity to me? Will you give me your livelihood? Would you trust me completely? And would you even trust me with your future and your identity? These are three huge things in the life of anybody who's called. But God will bless each and every person who is willing to be serious enough to give it all to him. I think back, in 1996, we sailed our boat to Mexico. That was turning. That was our turning to God. We only had half a verse that we're to seek the Lord, draw near to God. He'll draw near to us. Only half a verse. But unless we would have turned and actually did it, we wouldn't have drawn near. And then when we're in Mexico... God calls, he says, now I want you to missionary. I want you to be missionaries in the land. Kim said to me, I don't want to be a missionary's wife. Three weeks later, she came back and said, you know, if God says so, that's the right thing. To we had to turn, though, and do it. We couldn't just say our, we intend to. We had to go turn and make that happen. And then thirdly, God one day said, I'm calling you to pastor and plant a church. And Kim said, I don't want to be a pastor's wife. I never bargained for this. Three weeks later, she came back and said, if that's what God is saying, that's the prudent thing to do. 
But our good intentions weren't enough. We had to actually do it and step out of the boat. And then God said, oh, you turn, I'll bless you, and I'll give you my anointing to do what I'm calling you to do. Now, here's two things that happened to Moses and will happen to anybody who turns and receives the anointing. Number one, Moses was transformed. Two, God used Moses to transform a nation. The calling and the anointing is all about transforming us and letting God use us to transform some bigger plan that he has. Do you know God has a big plan, right? The plan of God is really big. But the call on my life is a much smaller plan than God's overarching overall plan. But he is calling each one of us and is willing to anoint us so we become part of the church that's fitting in to his big plan. God has a big plan. And it's to transform us and it's to transform nations. When I use that word transformation... I think of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. That word metamorpho, metamorphosis. And we've all heard the example about the ugly caterpillar. And then the cocoon. And the time of rest. And then the emerging out of the cocoon. But here's the amazing part. That... The DNA of the caterpillar in the cocoon becomes liquefied. That it's no longer this furry, ugly little something that crawls along slowly. It now is in a protected environment and the the liquid has the very same DNA as the caterpillar. But when God is ready, he breaks that cocoon open and out of it, soars something beautiful. This is a great picture of what God does as we throw down our rod. You know, after Moses threw the rod down, it never again was called the rod of Moses, it was called the rod of God. And what God does, every time that we throw the rod down, every time we answer the call, every time we turn, God says, I will anoint you, and you have this process going on where something old becomes something beautiful and new, but it takes this something that goes on in the middle. So I'd like to I'd like to leave you with a couple thoughts. Number one, Jesus said in John 15 that the Father is glorified when we bear fruit. When we bear much fruit, he's glorified. And he says, you can ask me what you want, and I'll give it to you that the Father be glorified in the Son. I take a look, I take a look at the turnings in life that God required. And every time, Every time there was fruit, there was more fruit. There was salvations, baptisms, people being transformed, people beginning to serve God. And some of the people never even believed that they would ever serve God. I think of a little Croatian woman who put 10 kids' kitchens in 10 different barrios. And through her effort and a lot of volunteers and a lot of giving, they just eliminated Childhood malnutrition in that part of the world. A little lady that never thought that she would... I didn't even know she was a Christian until she was baptized. God used her so mightily, but she had to make the turn. And she had to go for it. Today, we're fortunate that we have the opportunity to make a turn. There's a turn to planting a cluster of six churches, five or six churches. There's also an opportunity to plant an additional cluster of churches in Mexico. There's also an opportunity to plant churches east of homeland, out in the Hemet area going east. 
I'm taking a look at all these opportunities and I'm, I'm asking the Lord, how would all this be possible? It would be possible by anointing because in every area God is leading us, he's also got pockets of leaders. People who he has been working with already, who he has called, who he is anointing, and who he's preparing for the next chapter in their life. Each one will have to say what Moses said. I'm going to throw down the rod. God, you get my identity. I'll, I'll trust you for all my provision and my future. My destiny is in your hands. I'll give you everything. Now, for giving God everything, he will trust you with his anointing. That's the trade-off. You give God it all, and he'll give you his all. And then that all, that anointing, begins to take on a life of its own where you cannot control it. You cannot define it. You cannot handle it. You can't do anything except just hold on to God and let him take you wherever he wants to take you. And that's, that's where a lot of us are in our life right now. We're just holding on to God at this day and age, this time in history, and God's propelling us and taking us places that he wants to go. Because God has the master plan. He knows better than we do that in this fourth quarter of our life, at, at this season in our life, the world needs the anointing of God like it never needed it before. All of, the, all of the things that I mentioned early, the first page of the sermon, all of that stuff, that just pales in comparison by the troubles this world is in. I talked to a pastor last week. He said, Mike, I have never seen more sin in the world than I've seen today. What's the cure? The cure is the anointing of God. That's the good that overcomes the evil of the day. Just because God's good and God's in his anointing. My challenge to you tonight is what's in your hand? You know, it's fashionable to say today, what's in your wallet? But I'm, I'm going back to, to Exodus here and I'm going to ask, what's in your hand? What has God entrusted to you? What is God saying you're going to have to put it down if you're going to turn, if you're going to trust me? You've got to be willing to do it, and you've got to do it. But in exchange for that, God has an enormous blessing of his own nature, of his own character, and it's wrapped up in his anointing. And he's willing to give it to anybody who wants it bad enough. My prayer is for you and I that we'll want it bad enough. <clears throat> Now, I look around the room here, <clears throat> and I said, you know, I, I'd like to have between 50 and 100 people in the room. This is a pretty small crowd. And as I was praising, <clears throat> I thought of a story, a true story, many years ago in the 40s. Um, a group of farmers that went to a particular church in North Carolina, they said, we want to have a revival. Uh, but there's none of us qualified to do this revival. And this story just came to mind as we were praising here. Thank God for what you do have. Don't, thank, don't begrudge what you don't have. They hired an evangelist. His name is Mordecai Ham. All week, he preached at this little farmhouse. All week, he led revival. All week, he did altar calls. At the end of the week, only two boys came forward to receive. All that week, all that preparation, all the expense, everything that had to be invested to make this revival happen. And two boys on the last day. Now, one of the boys was the son of the farmer whose land they were preaching on. And the young boy was Billy Graham. There's a verse in the Bible, I can't think of where it is right now. But do not despise small beginnings. God will surprise you. The anointing of God is capable of surprising us and capable of doing the things that man cannot do in his own power, in his own ability. So 
my prayer right now, my prayer is that Father in heaven, may we see the place of turning in our life right now. Show us where to turn. Give us, give us the wherewithal to make the turn. Let us throw down the rod in our life, what's in our hand, so that we identify with you and we give up our own identity that we will take from your hand and only your hand that your provision is all we need and all we want. And third, whatever future I may have, however many years you might give me from this point forward, I give those to you. It all belongs to you because you're the rightful owner of every single thing. Now, when you turn, stay open. God wants to give his anointing to people even more than we want to receive it. So we need to get in tune with God. He's got it to give, and he has the will to give it. And it has to be you and him coming together in harmony and working this thing out. But just know, he's got it to give, he will give it, and he's asking us just a few important questions. Amen. Well, I'll ask Roger, Lord, pray for us and dismiss us, but I have a benediction for you. The apostle so Paul said to a church at Ephesus, and I say to you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all that are saved. Well, thank you, Father, once again for just delivering a word father that just um, penetrates uh, our lives in such a way that creates transformation father I thank you that each and every person that would leave here today would not just let this message go in one ear and out the other father but it would stop and it would and, and they would spend some time and take a look father uh, in their own life and find out uh, what it means for them to have that anointing and how can they use and what are they not letting go of father I pray that each and every person here would let go father or what perhaps is stopping them back for their destiny living out their destiny that you have for them father I thank you that we can trust you and we don't have to carry the burdens father when we live in the anointing that we heard about tonight we know that we're living a God-filled life according to your purpose and plans for our life as your word says, Father, that you do have plans and a purpose for our life to prosper and succeed us and not to harm us, Father. So we thank you for that and we give you all the praise and the honor, Father. We thank you that this week would be a kind of week, Father, that would be a supernatural week full of favor, grace, and mercy. Father, that each and every person that would leave here would be different and they would share their difference and people would even notice that they'd be different father and they'd ask them and would create conversation for transformation so father we give you all the praise and the glory in jesus name everybody said lay down your